Testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Test one, two, test one, two.
Okay, everybody. I think we're ready to go. Uh, has this been, is it just me or has this been an amazing, exhausting week? I mean, there's been so many different things going on, so many different activities underway across Singapore, amazing people from around the world. So I don't know how many of you, if any, went out to Expo for FinTech Festival and Switch and lots of different, we had our own Deep Tech Summit yesterday afternoon with some amazing scientists. And so now here we are again in order to try and have yet another amazing discussion with great people. So first of all, as always, thank you for being a part of what we're trying to do at SG Innovate. We're always here to celebrate entrepreneurial scientists building deep tech startups. We think Singapore has an important role to play on a global stage. So our basic premise is we need to invest, we need to build, we need to create. And so part of that is bringing people together to talk about important areas, things that we may agree on, things we may not agree on. We had a, a panel this morning in a different place talking about AI and the enterprise, and we had some big corporations there, and the whole discussion was how do we want to adopt artificial intelligence in our enterprise? What do we think about jobs? What do we think about people? What do we think about the fact that it changes how we might relate to each other? No right answer, no wrong answer, but it's important to discuss, and so that's what we're trying to do now, which is a topic that I hope is close to all of your hearts. It's certainly an area that I'm personally excited about and passionate about. The future of medical innovation could not be a bigger and, frankly, more broad topic because it affects so many different areas. It affects every single person in some way, and I think that's the reason that it's so relevant. Medical innovation, because we have an aging population that needs different types of healthcare, more people need different types of healthcare, and as that population ages, chronic conditions that stack up, and the first thing that used to afflict you was the thing that killed you not so many years ago, and now people can live for decades with more than one chronic condition that's under care and under management. How do we think about democratization of healthcare? More people having access to it so we don't continue to have the widening gap between the wealthy and the less wealthy, or the wealthy and the poor, and so that's a big concern. And what's the role of technology and artificial intelligence and robotics and so on? So there's a lot of very exciting things to explore and discuss, and I think we have, I hope, a lot of engagement from you because these things count if you're engaged. Uh, if you're there just to be purely a listener, that's also cool, but there's something missing. It's always better if you're engaged and asking questions and asking what you're excited about or, in fact, uh, discussing what you may be uncomfortable with. How is my data used? How do I think about privacy and so on? So in order to get us kicked off, I want to first of all say thank you to Ambassador Marguerite Vono, the uh, ambassador of the kingdom of the Netherlands to Singapore and Brunei. And it's great because we enjoy a lot of partnership with uh, the Netherlands and we do a lot of things together. And I'm reminded that this is the third event that we've enjoyed with Ambassador <laughs> this week alone. So we've got a lot of very exciting things covering a lot of different areas of technology. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, I first of all thanked Ambassador, and please, if I may, invite, invite uh, Ambassador Vono to the stage to share your own remarks. And then please be ready, because you know inevitably, if you're here, one of the must-dos is we will get a group photo memory moment. But first, I'll ask the Ambassador to share her thoughts. Please, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And indeed, it's becoming a little bit boring as the Innovate and the Dutch Embassy again. So I'm changing my dress all the time. So the different colors have different moods. Today, I'm in royal blue because my queen was in Singapore. Uh, it's like a fairy tale, but she's real. And she's a banker who really knows her fintech. So she's working on inclusive finance, also with artificial intelligence, whatever you can uh, have. And I'm very proud to work for her and for a lot of Dutch. Um, have you had any idea how many Dutch were wandering around at FinTech? Uh, some of them are still here, <laughs> beware. 
<laughs> but we started with one minister whom I invited at a dinner party, come to Singapore. You can learn a lot about artificial intelligence. There's organizations like SG Innovate who just want to be very open and learn from each other. He said, okay, I'll come. I'll bring my PA and one assistant. Uh, six months later, I have uh, over 100 persons. I have the Queen, a minister, uh, the Secretary General of the Ministry of Economic Affairs, who was also at the Deep Tech Summit yesterday, the Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice and Security with cyber, blockchain, and their learning as well. And here we are. Um, I don't know what you're going to do in the weekend, but I'm going to do nothing, <laughs> which we call <laughs> in the Netherlands Nixon. And actually, it's very good for your brain. It's just really doing nothing, and then you get the brightest bulb ideas. Uh, and one of those ideas I had together with Steve, let's do something at my residence on artificial intelligence. Because, hey, I knew my government was working on an artificial intelligence strategy. I knew the Singaporean government was. What I didn't know is that they could have copied their own strategies. So <laughs> but they didn't really know about each other as far as I'm concerned. So it's very interesting. We're 10,000 kilometers apart, but we are focusing on new technology from a human-centered way. Uh, I don't know your kids or if you do, I would know any teenagers. They want to control their data. They're much more savvy than the elderly generations in thinking, should I really uh, get my GPS locator on or not because I could be tracked and maybe then they know that they're not in school. So they're much more savvy and going into the next level. And healthcare is the last part of that level. Uh, I've had the privilege already to uh, speak to Dr. Homer Pien and I really like him because you are American uh, you could come from all over the world. You work for Philips, which is a great company, which is the company that came to Singapore because Dr. Albert Winsemius, who was the advisor to the then Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, told the bosses in Eindhoven, I'll quit if you don't come to Singapore. So sometimes one person can make a difference. And here they are, still very, very visible in Singapore for the region. But they gradually came to focus more on medical innovation. And I've been to the Singapore headquarters, and sometimes it's like you're really into your own science fiction movie. Like, wow, it's happening already, the things that are possible. But to implement it, to pay for it, to see how we can do it on a global scale, I find it really interesting. So before I conclude, I'd like to ask you, who lost weight this week at FinTech because of all the walking around. <laughs> because for me, it was a great conference. Very often you at the end are bulging because food is everywhere in Singapore and of good quality. But I think we nailed at this conference. Uh, we had a lot of food for thought. Uh, we had a lot of rushing and dealing to do because there was so much going on. And here at SG Innovate, our body comes to rest because just one chair you sit. But I know they always keep our minds very, very busy. Uh, and I myself am looking forward to learning more about the latest in, uh, developments, both on the technical side and the human side. So I would like to thank you for hosting the Dutch again and still listening. And <laughs> I'm looking forward to learning more about what we can do with AI in health. Thank you. Okay, everybody, uh, so let's do two things. We'll give Ambassador a standing ovation and be ready for our photograph all in one motion. So there we go. <laughs> so please, come on down. Okay. It's just uh, feel free to look, wave, smile, whatever you're going to do, because we're going to put this all across social media celebrating Singapore and entrepreneurship.
Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. So, if you were at the Singapore FinTech Festival, which yesterday morning, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Hank Sui Kit, actually announced Singapore's national AI strategy with five national AI projects that are designed to produce impactful social benefits for the years to come, and one of which is on healthcare and how AI could help to make lives better and deliver better patient care. And so it is most timely today that we have an expert from Philips Healthcare who will share with us his perspectives on how the future of medical innovation is going to be transformed with AI and other frontier technologies. And throughout the talk, uh, Dr. Homer Pian will be open to taking questions from you. So there is a very innovative technology called Slido that you could just access using your phone and post questions in real time. And Homer will be able to take the questions at the end of the conversation. But there is also a very traditional method of raising your hand and we'll pass the mic to you if you want to voice your question directly. So with that, without further ado, I would now like to invite Dr. Homer Pian, Chief Scientific Officer from Philips, to give us his talk. Let's, warm, let's give him a warm welcome of course. I, I, first of all, thank you all for being here. I, I'm absolutely honored to be here. Um, I do have to confess, I do not have the brain capacity to give my talk hold on to the microphone, not fall off the stage, and answer questions at the same time. So if you could do it the traditional way by raising your hand, that'd be fantastic. I will do the, what did you call that? Slide something. Uh, I will do that afterwards, uh, if that's okay. So with that, um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Can we? So what I'm gonna talk about today is um, artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare, but really from a diagnostic perspective. And in, do, in, in talking through that, one of the things that I wanna try to, try to discuss is, does artificial intelligence actually offer us enough capabilities to answer some of the big questions that we have to, we have to resolve within healthcare? So with that, we live in a pretty exciting time. We could do absolute wonders in healthcare at this point. What this particular slide shows is the uh, rate of death as a function of time. So what you could see is non-communicable diseases, com communicable or acute diseases, and versus injuries. All of this has been, been falling steadily over the last 20, 30 years. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, healthcare innovation has, been, ha has done absolute wonders uh, in, in terms of improving our livelihood. There is a fundamental belief that we have, which is healthcare will benefit from, a great, from, from greater access to digital health data. There is a preponderance of data that is available to us and the amount of data continues to grow every single day. There are data of all sorts. There are data that occurs on a day-to-day -day basis, and there's also data that occurs in a clinical setting. All of this is fantastic. Having said that, we've also got some pretty um, significant problems that we have to deal with. So this is data taken from the United States. Uh, the US actually wastes approximately 750 billion dollars per year on healthcare. Uh, the, the dominant factors include unnecessary services, uh, inefficient care delivery, and excessive administration costs. The other, I don't actually know where to stand. The, the other item that is uh, a little bit shocking is the statistic within the US is that we believe healthcare or medical errors account for approximately 200,000 deaths per year. This is an absolutely stunning number, and from a healthcare perspective, it's an unconscionable number. Right? So, medical so medication-related errors uh, account for almost half, errors related to diagnosis, that is incorrect, delayed, or omitted diagnosis, account for about 14% of the deaths. 
we have major health care problems that we need to deal with. One out of every three people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Uh, there's more than 500 million people around the world suffering from res respiratory diseases. These are all pretty scary statistics that we're talking about here. Those are pictures of today. That's nothing compared to the scariness we're going to see in a few more years. What you see on a global basis is the red curve represents the number of people that are ages five or under. The blue line, because we've done so well in healthcare, represents the number of people 65 or older. If we look at Singapore in and of itself, the ratio of elderly people to working age people, the working age people are the people financially supporting the elderly. The ratio of elderly to working age adult in Singapore is one to five in the year 2015, and by the time you get to 2030, it's one to two. These are absolutely stunning statistics. What are we going to do about this? When you look at it from the healthcare perspective, there are very profound dynamics that are shaping healthcare. Aging population we just talked about, global resource constraints, increasing com uh, consumer engagement, complexity of diseases and treatments. The way we treat diseases, things like cancer and cardiovascular disease, it's an order of magnitude more complicated than they were five to 10 years ago. We believe that artificial intelligence and digital health will enhance the people who use them, will adapt to the context, and are embedded into uh, people's workflow and daily environments. These are sort of the necessary factors in order for these things to make a dramatic difference. So what I'm going to do in over the next few slides is to really go through some very fast examples for you. The way we're going to talk about this for today is we're going to start off with radiology. We're going to start off with medical imaging. Radiology provides non-invasive localization and staging of disease, and approximately 70% of all patients receive at least one imaging study in the developed world. So radiology is sort of at the core of what we consider to be diagnostic tests. Imaging studies are key to guiding treatments and assessing outcome. So what we're gonna talk about is sort of in layers of the onion. Let's talk about radiology first. From radiology, how are we gonna form more precise diagnosis? Given more precise diagnosis, how do we now enable precision medicine? How do we enable better treatments and better outcomes? And ultimately, what we like to get to is taking care of the patient before symptoms even develop. How do we go about doing that? So I'm going to talk through this, uh, again, in fairly rapid fashion, um, just to give you an idea. You, you, you may be very accustomed to seeing ultrasound machines that, are, that sit on a cart that's a little bit unwieldy, and we have to wheel it to various places in order to use it. What we are looking at more and more is the ability to have ultra-portable ultrasounds. So these are ultrasound probes that now attach to an iOS or an Android device. So now we could provide much, much more accessibility uh, to medical imaging around the world. With ultrasound, what we're also doing now is we could take, this is what we call a four-chamber view, this is an image that we get from the intercostal region of the ribs, the space between the ribs, in which we see all four chambers of the heart at the same time. Ultrasound is a real-time imaging device, so we could see the heart beating. After a few cardiac cycles, we can now begin to automatically quantitate various physiological parameters. Your left ventricular ejection fraction, for example. We can now compute these things automatically. With that, with those sort of techniques, we're starting to, imply, to apply AI in order to model all the data that we're seeing. So whether it's modeling to enhance visualization, whether it's modeling to automatically quantitate, automatically measure certain features in the image, we can now begin to do all of these things. All of that is now being combined with better 
clinical technology, what you're seeing here then is a degree of um, accuracy and the level of detail that we've never been able to see before, all because of the, the rise of new technologies. And what you were seeing there was the, the, the details around the vascular structure of a tumor. What you're looking at here is actually a breast image. So you see a cartoon here. The cartoon has this green area. What you also see is a cartoon right next to that. What you're seeing in real time is the ultrasound probe as we're using that to scan a breast. What this now begins to do is we can now monitor whether the technician has provided full coverage of the breast or not. And in doing so, because we know exactly where the probe is, we could actually very easily mark where the lesion is. We can now pull out relevant views. We can now give a much more comprehensive assessment of breast tumor as a result of that. Relative to CT images, what we're doing now is we're trying to decrease the dose. We want to push down the dose as, as low as possible. When you do that, the images get really, really noisy. What do we do about that? We could actually use AI to substantially improve the quality of the images that we get so that that noisy image becomes this high quality diagnostic image. Similarly, sometimes imaging creates artifacts. What you're seeing here is the heart. This particular patient has a coronary stent in it. The stent is made out of metal. When you image metal with CT, it creates those streaks. The streaks are so bright that it'll actually obscure some of the features around it. With AI, we can now begin to remove all of that. Here is an example of um, something that's actually very hard to see. In this particular case, the patient has lung cancer. With this particular patient, we do a body scan. We try to make sure that we don't see tumors anywhere else. And when you look at the data, the data looks beautiful. The patient looks perfectly fine uh, relative to the other organs. As it turns out, this patient actually has metastatic disease that you could see within the vertebrae. This is only visible if you use a particular type of CT uh, image. In this particular case, it's called a calcium suppression image that really begins to highlight for you uh, the details inside the bones by subtracting out the calcium that's inside bones. The reason this turns out to be important is radiologists are used to seeing that image on the far left. But because of the way data is actually acquired, we could see more details in there than the radiologists could see conventionally. So we're actually building the AI that detects the presence of disease even though the radiologist can't see it. Um, and the presence of the cancer, presence of the metastases are also confirmed in MRI scans. Another thing that we're doing right now using AI, for those of you that have been inside a MRI machine, it's a little bit intolerable Despite all the data that we get, despite all the wonderful information we extract out of the MRI, it's miserable being inside this machine, right? You're cramped up, you're in an uncomfortable position, it's loud, everything vibrates. It is miserable for the patient, and when the patient's miserable, what happens? They move. When they move, we create low quality images. What we're doing now is, Using AI, there's actually the opportunity to substantially accelerate the rate at which um, we, could, we could obtain MRI images. When patients move, we create artifacts. Here's an example of a brain MRI. You can see these ringing structure around it. These are motion artifacts. I know I'm going to fall off the stage. Those are ringing artifacts, and what we could do with AI is we could actually remove that. AI is everywhere in medical imaging. From the ability to automatically detect the presence of lung lesions, to tracking tumors over time, to looking at how the brain uh, loses uh, brain tissue, brain matter, 
over time so we could do a volumetric analysis uh, to look at neurodegenerative diseases all the way to vessel analysis, right? These are just some, some quick snapshots of, of ways in which AI is helping. We could track how a tumor is progressing over time. We could do all of this stuff automatically. That was all on the radiology side. But it's also important to recognize that radiology is but one diagnostic modality. There's also, for example, pathology. And with pathology becoming digital, what we're seeing more and more of is the opportunity, for example, to look at H&E stains or immunohistochemistry stains and create all sorts of detailed, exquisite data uh, from uh, histopathology scans. Of course, once the data is digital, once you have this on your computer rather than inside a, a, a microscope slide, you can now begin to use a lot more computer vision techniques. You can begin to use AI to automatically quantitate the number of tumor cells you're seeing and therefore how aggressive are the tumors. All of this stuff is now being integrated into various uh, systems. But what's kind of interesting is the following. <clears throat> what we also have the ability to do now is we could actually pull out in your particular hospital, for example, all the, all the data of all the past patients that are similar to the patient that you're looking at. So the blue lines that you're seeing are all of the similar patients to the red line. The red line is the particular patient that is being examined at the present time. What this allows us to do is to now data mine the data. In other words, if the blue line shows for this particular patient at this age with this prostate cancer of this size, with this mutation at this location, and all of these past patients were treated with radiation therapy, and now you could begin to look at the outcomes of those patients, you can now make an intelligent decision about whether this particular patient, the one that's in red, should be treated the same way, or whether this patient would get more of a benefit from, being, from alternative treatments. So this is where AI now starts to, in, ver in a very practical way, AI is now helping us predict the outcome of a particular therapy and therefore select the best therapy for this particular patient. We also have AI running in interventional systems. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is for example, if we, put a stent at a particular location, how would that impact the outcome of the patient? How would that change blood perfusion to the heart, right? That's an example of, of, again, being able to be much more predictive of the therapy that we're imposing. This is what we call a floral study. We're running a catheter, so we make a cut here, we thread up a catheter, that w and, s and send that wire around the coronary vessels till we get to the place where we need to go. What should be apparent to you is, it's very hard to see actually where the blood vessel is. Therefore, what we've done using AI is to actually augment that view so that you actually see exactly where you're going so you know how to thread your catheter through the coronary vessels. What we're also working on is augmented reality. So in this particular case, we're using the ability to, to, to take a look at voice, gesture, and eye tracking to control what the uh, physician needs to see in real time. In a similar way, what he or she sees could actually move with him. So the table side controls are down here. What if the surgeon is on the other side? Well, now he doesn't actually have to let any, anything go and walk around the table to control uh, the scanner. We could actually do all of these things virtually. In the context of um, prostate cancer, what we're also beginning to do is to integrate the preoperative information, in this case MRI, with what the urologist sees, which is ultrasound. So from the MRI, we indicate where the tumor is. 
in real time use ultrasound to guide the biopsy. After the biopsy is performed, this data is now fed back to radiologists so that we can actually see exactly where the biopsy is taken from. All of this requires AI to real time fuse the ultrasound images to the MRI images. What's fascinating is simply by doing so, simply by using that AI to provide better guidance, we could actually now improve our ability to detect aggressive prostate cancers by about 30%. So we've talked about radiology, we've talked about the integration of radiology with uh, pathology. We talked about how those things can now be used to impact the treatment. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually say something intelligent about how the patient should be treated in the first place? So in this particular case, this is what we call population health. By looking at population health data, we can now begin to focus our attention on the patients that need the attention most. So we're able to cut healthcare costs by about 34% at this institution. We could cut readmissions rate. We could reduce the length of stay. We could reduce the number of hospitalizations. All of these are necessary steps in order to reduce the cost of healthcare. It's also important to recognize that AI is still at a very, very early age. What will happen is there's going to be lots and lots of people developing AI. So what needs to happen is we all need to start developing ecosystems that allows everybody's AI model to be incorporated. Okay? This is a fairly new concept for industry in the sense that industry historically likes to keep everything proprietary. But I think for certain things, those days are sort of over. You really have to open up the entire system so that everybody else's innovation could be brought into your particular system. And that's what we're, we developed. So here's an example of some of the places that, that we're working with in, in the context of that e ecosystem. And what it provides for you now is the ability to actually compare different AI models very, very quickly. In this particular case, we're looking at two different third-party vendors uh, none of these are Phillips algorithms. These are third-party algorithms in which you're looking at the lung lesion uh, assessment produced by these things. This kind of innovation really helps the adoption of AI because we're, we're creating the ecosystems that allows third parties to be integrated more readily. Now the question is, we started off talking about some really, really big healthcare problems. And the looming crisis for us is this aging population. What are we going to do with that? Is there enough, do we have enough technological wizardry to be able to overcome that looming crisis? It's not at all clear, right? As much of a proponent of technology as I am, it's not completely obvious to me for a couple of different reasons. M macroeconomically, what we do know is prices tend to rise more slowly when labor productivity increases more rapidly. So what you could see, for example, is wireless communications, electronic appliances, and so on. These prices have fallen dramatically because the productivity has increased substantially. So productivity correlates to prices. This is all US-based data. When we look at healthcare in a 30 year time span from 1990 to approximately 2010, healthcare productivity, so, so keep in mind this time period, the computer revolution was part of this, right? The whole migration from, PC, from uh, centralized computers, mainframes, to personalized computers took place during this time span, time span. During this time span, during these 30 years, Healthcare productivity decreased by 0.8% per year every single year. So even as technology is improving, healthcare remains incredibly resilient to that productivity change. Why is that? Well, for a lot of reasons. Drug prices keep going up. 
complexity of procedures. And frankly, it's not at all obvious to me that when you go talk to your physician, you want to shrink that time more and more. Right? There are certain things that can't be shrunken any more than they are today in the healthcare environment. Those things put a ceiling on how productive we could really be. Let me give you a second example. <coughs> we look at, so this is data actually that came from a colleague of mine over at Siemens. When we look at how money is spent in the US healthcare system, category A, we spend $130 billion. These are healthy patients. They account for 160 million people. You get to early stage disease, we spend $800 billion on 110 million people. Until you get end stage disease, the most severe disease, we spend $100 billion on 2 million people. What does this actually tell us? Now, take an average. When a patient is healthy, it costs $812 per patient. Early stage disease, they are an order of magnitude more expensive. When you get to end stage disease, they are another order of magnitude more expensive. The earlier we could detect, the earlier we could treat, the cheaper it is for the healthcare system. That's really the, the point of this slide. So while we're very, very excited about AI, it's not at all clear to me that the things we're developing today are sufficient. What we absolutely need to look at are things like digital twins. Digital twins are gonna be detailed models, digital models of the anatomy, of the physiology, and of the pathophysiology. With these models, what we expect to do is get to the stage in which we have a single patient view that's supplemented by AI. So we have data for a particular patient. We have a, data, we have a digital twin running in the background. This digital twin is looking at all the data that's available for this patient, the genomic profile, the imaging studies, the family history, the clinical and behavioral history, lab tests, your diets, your exercise rates, all of that data. All of that data comes in here. The AI is running continuously. We have to get to the stage in which we're not simply waiting for symptoms to arise before we start taking care of the patient. We have to get to the stage in which we have predictive analytics running continuously so that once we see a trend, a negative trend happening, we begin to take care of the patient at that point. Okay. By the time we actually wait for symptoms to arise, the cost has gone up considerably. That's where AI really, really needs to get to in order for us to have an impact on the big looming healthcare questions. That's really all that I have. Um, artificial intelligence and digital health, they really do represent fairly dramatic opportunities to improve healthcare in general. The goal uh, for using AI in healthcare is really to, deli to deliver more definitive diagnosis, more precise therapies while lowering the cost. But in order to have sufficient impact on the cost of healthcare, dramatic advancements in earlier diagnosis must occur. We do believe AI plays a factor in that. That's really all that I have. Uh, I'm happy to, to entertain any questions. Thank you. Oh, please. Uh, I have a question is that I know the preventive and the treatment are very important, but recently I also heard a lot about exponential medicine and they're trying to do things like uh, uh, metabolism maintenance and all this uh, uh, weird and smart stuff. What is your opinion? My, my, my personal opinion is that I am very much driven by data. 
I want to see evidence that something works before I really believe in it. I don't think the evidence is there at this point for some of those techniques. Now, having said that, I'll also give you a counterexample. If all we ever do is evidence-based medicine, if all we ever do is we wait for there to be evidence before we do something, we would never invent the parachute, right? How do you test that the parachute works? Are you really gonna throw a person out, in a, uh, out of an airplane without a parachute to say that person dies so that you have evidence that the parachute saves people, right? So, so there are some limitations to evidence-based medicine, but in general, I am a strong believer in developing evidence before we make large-scale healthcare decisions. Yes, sir. Uh, great talk, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, your last comment uh, about digital twins. So uh, clearly, you know, that's where uh, ideally we want to be. So uh, as far as I've seen the literature, only uh, heart has been, you know, the, the closest that we have got to creating some form of a digital twin. So in your opinion, how far are we from uh, creating at least organ-based digital twins? Are we five years away, 10 years away? What do you think? Thank you. I think digital twins will be a bit of a sliding scale. I don't think it's all or none. It's really complicated in the sense that not only is one organ complicated, not only is one disease complicated, but there's interactions between organs. So when you have cardiovascular diseases, it begins to <coughs> impact your lung capacity, for example. The other thing is there are correlations. There are comorbidities that happen. Um, cancer patients receiving tyrosine kinase uh, treatment for, for uh, cancer, tyrosine kinase inhibitors turns out to create ca cardiac cardiotoxicity. It actually impacts your heart. So what makes things really, really complicated is the interplay among them. So coming back to, to your question, when do we expect to see tangible impact from digital twins? I suspect that that's somewhere around three to five years away. I think we're gonna actually see some benefits even earlier than that, but really significant amount of benefits probably three to five years away. To really be able to model a comprehensive view of the human body with multiple organs, with multiple diseases, with lots and lots of models running, with numerous narrow AIs running in the background, we're probably at least 10 years away. That, that'd be my feeling. Uh, who's got the microphone? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, thank sir. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, could you? share any information or insight about how you create your five clinics, like how many scientists you have and how do they work with AI engineers, that sort of information. So we have several thousand engineer, um, engin people in R&D. And among those several thousand, we probably have about 60, 65% of that being software and AI and analytics. It is very much a big focus of, of ours. And I don't know for a fact, but I would suspect that as you look at other large healthcare device companies, the ratios aren't gonna be all that different, right? So whereas we used to have a lot more emphasis on hardware, um, it's not that hardware isn't important, but the ability to extract maximum use out of that hardware is relying more and more on data and on algorithms. And that's where the emphasis is today. It's also worthwhile noting that, that things have gone into cycles. Right? So you know, 20 years ago, um, hardware was absolutely the emphasis. So everybody was building brand new uh, CT, CT hardware, and MRI hardware, and so on and now the trend has shifted. There's no doubt in my mind that somebody, some, some you know, bright somebody is gonna come along and in, uh, invent a new mechanism for imaging so that we can now all begin to image our livers using our iPhone or something, and then everything will shift again. Yes, sir.
Next question. <laughs> my, my guess is that that's going to be very geography dependent. So in Europe, the patient owns their own data. In the US, healthcare institutions own their data. And the, the, the notion of ownership, I think, has substantial implications for the question that you're asking. Right? So somebody built a mathematical model, but that model is run on my data. So the output of that model, who actually owns that, that's fundamentally what you're asking. I don't have a clue. I think that it's going to be several years before the various medical legal systems around the world catch up to where innovations are going. I don't think there's a straight answer to, to that at all at this point. I, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer. I just, I don't have a crystal ball to, to figure this out. I know, all I know is this is going to be an exceedingly complicated question to answer. Yes, sir. You touched on a very important point a couple of times in your presentation, which is around prevention. Um, but it seems that most of the money, anxiety stuff, is happening in diagnosis and treatment. What are the bright lights you see or innovations or advancements you see that are very exciting in prevention, pre-diagnosis? So, so, so the story that we'd like to say is, again, using the U.S. as an example, We know how to cure cardiovascular diseases. If I could get everybody to eat less, exercise more, and stop smoking, we could decrease cardiovascular diseases by 50%. But people don't do it, right? Everybody wants a happy little pill that takes care of their problems for them. Prevention has to start playing a much bigger role. I'm in this community. I know what I should be eating on a day-to-day -day basis. But boy, when I get home and see that pizza sitting there, it sure is tempting to, to, to go ahead and eat as much of that as, as I can. The short answer is, I don't know what the limitations are to prevention because of human nature. We know already a lot of the right things to do to prevent disease, yet we don't adopt that. There has to be some better mechanism to incentivize people to actually adopt these healthy habits. I haven't seen those models yet. I don't think we've really truly invented what those things are. I would love for the startup community to actually come up with some brand new ideas you know, if you look at climate change, this whole thing about um, paying for your carbon footprint, I think that's an incredibly innovative idea. It, it, it probably hasn't had the impact that we wish that it would, but it made people cognizant about their ca carbon footprint, right? So awareness is sort of the first step. I'm hoping that somebody comes up with a brilliant idea on the healthy living on the prevention side that would do something similar to that. I, I'm, I'm clearly not smart enough to know what that is, but there may be, may very well be somebody smart enough here that, that can answer that. Is there anything on this? You look. Otherwise I'll fall off the stage. Uh, are there any other questions? I read in an interview that you mentioned that for AI uh, to be adopted in the medical field, it would be more in workflow AI versus clinical a AI. Could you explain more about these two concepts? Yeah, so, um, so, so I'll, I'll rephrase your question a little bit. So in the context of what you just said, I would rephrase your clinical AI by the term AI that requires regulatory approval and reimbursement. Reimbursement takes a long, long time. 
And so in, in certain complex healthcare systems, a clinician is reimbursed for the work that they do. So maybe they'll, in the US, maybe they'll get $40 or $30 to read a chest x-ray. Now there's a piece of AI that could help them do that. Who pays for that AI? If I'm the right now overworked, I'm working 16 hours a day, I'm exhausted, um, my, my ability to bring home a work a, a, a acceptable wage has decreased over the last 20 years. Am I gonna give up my $30 per chest x-ray so that I could give $6 to the AI company that developed an x-ray algorithm? The point of what I'm saying is the model to monetize clinical AI algorithms, it's not clear what that business strategy is, right? Because we don't know who pays for, for some of these reimbursement things. Are physicians really a inclined to give up a portion of their salary in order to use this AI, even if the AI could possibly improve their performance? Because of the lack of clarity on these things, <coughs> it's probably easier helping a hospital become more efficient, right? These are the workflow things. So in that context, if I could help a hospital save a dollar, maybe I could get five cents out of that dollar. So the, the, the product development strategy, the path to getting revenues for these products are easier in many, in most cases, with workflow algorithms than they are with clinical decision support algorithms. That's really where that's coming from, right? So within the US, to the best of my knowledge, at this point in time, there are zero differential reimbursement algorithms, di differential reimbursements for AI algorithms. In other words, what you wanna do is, you, for a company developing AI, you want there to be some extra reimbursement for the AI that you've created. Otherwise, nobody will ever pay for it. It doesn't exist yet. Right? So this path to, a bit to the appropriate business model, because of how fast things are changing, that's not obvious at this point. Just to build on that, what are the neat things that Philips Health is working on right now that are market facing? So what do you got cooking in Eindhoven that's gonna come to the market? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so what does Philips Health have coming out of the pipeline that's market facing that takes AI and applies it? Because you just uh, uh, mentioned problems, so what's the solution? And how does your research lab, based mostly in Eindhoven, fill those problems? So, so from our perspective, we at this point in time already have in excess of 100 different AI things running in our existing products. And we're continuing to de develop more. The question is, are those developmental activities gonna be strong enough, gonna be cost effective enough to really overcome the looming crisis in healthcare? In my mind, the answer is not a chance. Right? So we are embarking on these digital twins we're working with the community to develop better and more sophisticated models. So there, there is a academic institution in the US, for example, that actually have exquisite models for cells and the rate at which they're replicating over time as a function of their receptors and which receptors are, are activated. Now, you can imagine, I now take those models and I incorporate what we know about tumor cells. Now I can figure out the rate at which tumor cells are growing, and when tumor cells get dense enough, I know what I can begin to see using imaging. So when I actually take an imaging measurement, I can actually say something about the presence of tumor cells, how dense they are, and if I know something about their receptors, I can know something about the rate at which they're replicating, right? So these models are actually very much being worked on by the community at this point. We need a lot more attention on developing those models. But all of those things are in flight uh, as we speak. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks for excellent uh, presentation. Um, also relating to all this is, in order for a 
the AI and the AI models to work, you need good quality and quantity, a lot of data. So you have one of the strictest privacy law, right? So how do you overcome that? So related to, I think in you can um, take out the names, autonomize, autonomize the data so that you, you can do it without knowing the patient names. But in many of the medical areas, right, how do you tie the two and how do you overcome that so that at the end of the day you do build uh, the best AI model? Can, can the two of you get together so that you go, <laughs> go to a different corner of the room? Um, great question. I, I, think what's, I, I think what we're gonna see is sort of a bifurcation. And the bifurcation will be the following. For small limited studies, it'll be fine to enter into certain agreements with, with healthcare institutions to have their data anonymized so that they could be operated on. Right? That's sort of one model. Ultimately, you t for, for large scale AI deployment, you have to test it on huge amounts of data. And in those cases, it's gonna be very, very difficult to move the data into a centralized location. The alternative technique is what we call federated processing. So you take a, a piece of AI, you develop some uh, initial model, you train it at site one, you train it at site two, you train it at site three, you try to do this in parallel. You then aggregate them all back you now have a combined model that you trained on. You now send it back out again, test it again, test it again, until everything converges, right? That way the data is never moved. You never violate the privacy concerns. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, that seems to be the only way in existence right now to really overcome the issue that you're talking about, right? We're gonna be many, many years off to having large scale fully anonymized, well-curated repositories. Those are far and few in between. Short of that, we, we have to do these federated techniques. Doctor. Yes. Uh, not surprisingly, SG Innovate is positively biased in favor of AI startups working on health-related problems. But one of the things that we're thinking through is how do we bridge this concept of trust so today, the patient-doctor scenario is, you said it's this way, and as a general statement, I trust you because you're much more well-educated and much more experienced than me, so let's go. Some people might like to understand more, but generally it's, okay, doc. How do you anticipate a future in which, we, we don't see the future in which AI, quote, replaces, but always supports, assists. So will the future be something where that trust has to be implied and imputed to the AI engine or because the doctor is always the last meter, the face, that it doesn't really matter what's happening behind the curtain. It's sort of a Wizard of Oz type scenario. So as long as the doc is the person sitting in front of the patient, can he or she be 60, 70, 80, 90 percent augmented and supplemented by AI and this concept of trust is a non-issue because the person is always relating to the doctor, or do we have to think about the trustability of the AI in order for patient adoption and doctor adoption to become more believable? In my opinion, in my personal opinion, I think it's gonna be both. I think that companies have to take a heck of a lot more responsibility for the data that they're <coughs> using, for ensuring that there's no bias in the data, for um, the security of the data, for ensuring that the data is fully anonymized, for publishing how you validated the data, for um, you know, just all of these privacy and security concerns. Right? Now I would also say, I'm just hoping my CEO doesn't shoot me for saying this. <laughs> I, I, I would also say that one of the things that also needs to happen is the pun punitive damages has to increase substantially for companies like Facebook and so on to actually begin to take privacy much more seriously. I think that's issue one, right? The second issue is, as you said, there's a man in the loop. The man ultimately makes the decision. I think we're rapidly approaching the, the time in which there's gonna be so many decisions made 
that having a man in the loop is not always uh, a possibility. Relative to human nature, we recognize that there are drivers that kill pedestrians around the world every single day. Yet in a self-driving car, the car kills one person, the entire industry stops, right? We are much, much more tolerant of human error than we are of machine errors. So there, there's a culture change that also needs to happen along the way. So how quickly will it, would it take for us to get there? I don't really know. I do know that we're all very, for those of us developing AI, we're all very, very worried about the liabilities associated with these things. Even if we say this particular AI um, needs a clinician's approval before you, before you do something, right? We're all striving to make this AI. So, so let me give you a concrete example. Let's say that we develop a lung lesion detection algorithm that's pretty good at identifying which lesions are cancerous. But a radiologist still has to make that diagnosis. Over time, we improve that algorithm. That algorithm gets better and better and better. There will come a day when that radiologist is going to trust that AI so much that that AI de facto is making the decision, even though that was never the intended use. At that point, I mean, the, so, so everything you said is right, but there's going to be a very logical evolution in which, despite that safety, safety net, how it's actually going to be used will be very different. Right? So those days are coming, I'm sure of it. Yes, sir. It, it, it's going to take a while for me to come up with a politically acceptable answer to this. I think IBM Watson, IBM Health. Got too hyped too quickly before the results are there. And given some of their spectacular failures, it's created um, a lot of distrust in what they're able to deliver. Over the long run, I am absolutely confident that they're on the right path, they will do the right thing, and the AI will be very, very useful. Um, but it's quite clear that it's been overhyped. It's quite clear that it, as of today, it has not met expectations. Um, and I think, I think that's actually a very good reminder for all of us in this community that what we say we should be able to back up with data, with actual things. We shouldn't let marketing run ahead of the clinical and the science and the R&D. So that, that's sort of my, my semi-politically correct answer. How many people in the room are from IBM? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, the way I would, yeah, no, no. I, but. I think everybody has a specialization. So another way you could think of it is Chief Phillips Health is very focused on excellence in healthcare, and IBM is focused on a wide range of things, including healthcare. That's right. I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you wanted to, to make any comments about <laughs> <laughs> On a personal level as a co-host, I'd like to keep it focused on not sort of company against company, right. but this idea of where are we going as society and humanity. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the point. I mean, I, I think that Philips, um, again, I would say that we have hundreds of products already that embeds AI, I think, very, very practical about how it promotes AI capabilities. And that from my perspective, AI is not the answer. AI is not the panacea to all sorts of problems. AI is simply a technology it is an en enabling technology. It'll allow us to do a lot more things, but we have to be awfully careful about how we use it, where we apply it, uh, and the limitations of that technology. I have, oh, please. Hey. 
One other question before, but make sure everybody has their question first. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for the talk. My, my name is Isara from the NUS Enterprise, where we commercialize the research from the university by creating uh, great deep tech startups. Uh, I see the title is The Future of Medical Innovation, and I'm quite surprised that um, the focus is more about, or almost so only about AI without the, the underlying materials that are also part of the medical innovation. Uh, putting that aside, um, my question is about the the willingness and the framework by which uh, Philips engages with early stage startups. So I have a f with me a couple of uh, early stage startups. One is developing a, a very unique uh, materials for low dose X-ray imaging. The other one is for membranes, 2D membranes. And my question is how willing is Philips to engage with this type of early stage startups? And how patient are you? How patient are you? We're, 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 we're we engage in many tens, if not hundreds, of startup companies. We actually have an entire program in which we work with startup companies that may not have as deep of roots in healthcare and helping them build better propositions and so on and so forth. So we're absolutely committed to this sort of part of the ecosystem in which there's new, uh, new technologies coming in. We're very excited about startups. We invest in startups. We work with startups. We license their products and so on. You know, so so all of the all the, all of the, um, the traditional things. What was the second part of your question? Ah, the patience question. De-risking is a big, big part of the process. Um, from a big company perspective, so so at this point in time, I probably get pinged about ten or twelve times a week by email. Am I interested in looking at X, Y, or Z? And me and my staff, we simply don't have enough time to actually go look through every single one of these and follow up on every single one of these. So we look for evidence, right? We, we look for, so if the, Im if the impact is going to be incredibly high, it's easy to take high risk, high return sort of ventures and deal with them that way. If the AI, I'm sorry, if the startup company is a company that's working on something that we know of, 20 other companies are working on similar things, then we're going to want to see a lot more de-risking along the way before we actually engage. Right? So I hope that, that sort of made sense. Um, so for example, we know of um, about 14 different AI companies that's working on breast mammography. I'm not sure that there's that much differentiation, right? So, so what then really needs to work is sort of the business model, the de-risking of the business model, the proof of principle on various milestones before we would engage. I think from our past experience, this could go on until 8 or 9 p.m. So I think in respect of Dr. Homer Pins and everyone's time, we'll just have time for one last question here. Um, hello, sorry, my voice is gone. Too much talking at Switch, I'm afraid. Um, the question I'd ask you is, do you, what role do you see for digital therapeutics, which is the, the big new trend in the pharma, do you see comp startup companies coming through, some of which are getting quite large, which are related to how do you apply data to better application of therapeutics? And um, so is that something that Philips, you've talked about diagnosis, giving more precise therapies, but there's the other aspect of the digital therapeutics campaigns. So can you be more specific about what digital therapeutics means to you? <laughs> no, I was hoping you were gonna do that for me. <laughs> I've heard presentations by digital therapeutics, uh, 
therapeutics companies. Um, and I guess it's about better compliance by patients and better understanding of patient outcomes because of their, the way in which um, drugs are used by patients. So it's, it's not just compliance, but it's taking a holistic view of the, of the patient and the drug um, and trying to track, trying to combine that data together, I think, is the, is the way I see it anyway. So, so digital therapeutics means a couple of different things in, in, to my understanding. One is sort of what you just said, which uh, we also call re real world evidence. So these are patient reported outcomes. So it's not just about my taking a particular drug, but it's my reporting as I'm taking this drug, what are the unintended side effects that I'm experiencing? And you know all of the other things that go with undertaking that therapeutic regimen. That's sort of one camp. There's another camp of digital therapeutics that we, uh, that, that we look at. So in this particular case, you can imagine, for example, a, um, in patients that have experienced a brain injury. So traditionally what they would do is you would give them a paper and pencil test uh, that says, you know, seven plus eight equals, and there's a whole bunch of tests and you were timed on the test. And what people are starting to discover is that if we don't just look at the answers, but we look at how the patient is figuring things out and their process of figuring things out. So in other words, actually using an iPad to capture what they're writing down and the moment at which they're writing this down, this now actually provides much richer data about the the time course evolution of the injury and therefore how they're improving over time, right? So, so that's sort of a different case in which the digital capture uh, allows us to, to actually be much more, to, to allows us to be much more holistic about the treatment that they're experiencing. So there, there are multiple contexts to, to what you just said. Uh, on, on the basis of the examples that we're talking about, we're absolutely thrilled about these things. Uh, I think the evidence is still accumulating on how, exa how useful they really are, but it, it, intuitively they seem rational in how they're being used, and therefore I, I, you know, I think we're wholly supportive of them. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Homer Pion. <laughs> Thanks again. And of course, it's been, it's been an incredibly insightful talk, and I want to once again thank you, Madam Ambassador, for joining us, as well as our friends at the Netherlands Innovation Network, Natalie and Astrid, for having a very, very good and exciting week uh, with, between Singapore and the Netherlands. And thank you to everyone for joining us and sitting through everything here. There's been no question posted on our online platform because everyone has been paying full attention to what Homer has been saying. Thank you for joining us, and have a good evening.